Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Caroline Sanders. I'm really excited to be presenting to you today. Um, I'm in the process of moving, so I'm presenting from two different cameras right now. So I'll do my best, but like this is what, what it's like being in a pandemic. Um, but thank you so much for coming, and I'm excited to share with you my talk. Wonderful. So hi everyone, I'm Caroline Sanders, and I'm excited to give a talk today on how creative practices can influence technology and what we can learn from design and art. Hi, I'm Caroline. I'm an artist and researcher, and I work at the intersections of civil society and the private sector, looking at the impacts of technology and society and its effects on marginalized groups. I've held residencies with BuzzFeed and iBeam, Pioneer Works, the Mozilla Foundation, the Harvard Kennedy School, and others. And I currently sit on a working group with the United Nations looking at data privacy in children. And I'm also an artist with Ars Electronica's AI Lab. Research-driven art is how I define my practice. It's art that is shaped and driven by research, be it quantitative or qualitative. I don't make data viz, but I could. But the way I think about it is, what if one made net art or technology-based art with the same principles as photojournalism? Net art is art that is influenced by the aesthetics and the language of the internet. It was popularized in the early 90s and then early aughts. Like photojournalism, research-driven art uses a specific or uses specific structures and a sense of purpose to constrain it. These constraints work much like how the skeleton works. While they stabilize the practice just as the rib cage stabilizes the body, they do not define the entire practice nor keep it from moving and flexing on its own. So in this way, the research I do stabilizes and shapes my art, but does not di dictate the outcome. In late May, or er, in late May 2020, after the United States erupted in protests for Black Lives Matter and after George Floyd's death, I saw a number of curators and critics remark on social networks about tech artists and their roles in unpacking technology injustice and activism. Now, most of the artists they were mentioning were white and male. So over email, I chatted with my friend, the curator and writer, Nora Khan, and we discussed artistic practices during moments of cultural upheaval. Khan wrote, quote, how might critical technology work be called on in this moment to do more? Coded design work has that capacity. Hybrid research practices can explain and expose the logics of racial capitalism, but under the auspices of artistic collaboration. These can enact critique and make an argument through process and through a built system. This idea, or rather the idea of usefulness in interdisciplinary work is a key and necessary part of a research-driven arts practice and one that is directly extremely inspired by Tanya Bergera's Arte Util, which means utilitarian art. Arte Util draws on artistic thinking to imagine, create, and implement tactics that change how we act in society. Again, heavily focused on usefulness, on tool building, and on communities. Khan highlighted in her email that the strengths of work stretching across domain can make art a necessary Trojan or course to discuss useful change. This is where I personally turn to the work of American artists whose work you see here. Francis Singh, Joanna Mole, Adam Harvey, Mimi Onowa, Forensic Architecture, and others. These artists are pulling from research or investigatory based practices with work that manifests into a variety of outputs, artifacts, writings, and education. The practices of American artists or the anonymous group behind ScanMap, which is scanning police scanners and sharing that information with the public, are great examples of social justice and human rights driven art especially with ScanMap's current work on tracking and open sourcing and sharing uh, police activity by listening to police scanners or American artist work. I'm blue, if I was blank, I would die in my blue window. Two pieces that comment on the structure and violence of modern police forces. And you see a still of that here. Other works of social justice, research and artistic practices are works like The Hidden Life of an Amazon User by Joanna Mole or Adam Hardy's E-Frame research, which you see here, which came out of Hardy's numerous collaborations with the Human Rights Archiving Group, the Syrian Archive, 
is using computer vision and open source investigation to label and unpack different human rights atrocities that are happening currently in Syria. You can even look at the investigative work of forensic architecture. One example of a research and social justice-based art practice is Mimi Onwa. Onwa's research on the politics and justice of data sets have resulted in artworks like the Library of Missing Data Sets and the widely cited and canonical zine and educational tool, The People's Guide to AI, co-written with Diana uh, J. Musera. These pieces and artists occupy a liminal space of research, journalism, and art. The why design, because everything around us is designed from how I entered this Zoom meeting to how you opened a door to why we can't, why we can or cannot block people on Slack, we can't, to how information is presented to us on Twitter and how the world physically and then digitally surrounds us. Now this slide is a cheeky nod to Don Norman who's the author of The Design of Everyday Objects, which has shaped the modern design world. But effectively, in the design world, there's been an assumption that design is universal, universal seamless, and intuitive. And it's not. In some cases, like these doors, design makes objects appear to function one way when they do not. But even further, why does design matter when we talk about algorithms, AI, recommendation systems, machine learning, or even technology in general? Because design can elevate and obfuscate. Design isn't just a skill, but a practice and a language in and of itself. Design is an equalizing force that distills code and policy into understandable interfaces. It can mask or it can uplift aspects of that technology and aspects of that policy. To really start solving problems around complex issues and creating spaces for human connection and agency along with consent, Design needs to be at the equal forefront of our conversations around software. Design is what distills policy and code into these digestible and interactable interfaces for users. Design is the thing that explains what code and policy are outlining. So for issues like labor, harassment, security, and privacy, design is important. But how does design translate policy? Online harassment reporting interstitials are a great example. Users don't have to deeply understand a social network's policy on harassment in order to report it. Design can take the technical infrastructure, the ability to select a piece of content, click on it, and then click what kind of harassment it is, as well as the political infrastructure, the kind of harassment or harm that the content falls into, um, which can be described, uh, which can describe the platform's policy in a short and understandable way to all users, and then fold those processes into product design the harassment reporting system. Security settings are another example. For a user to report content, they shouldn't have to be a lawyer. And to adjust security settings, they shouldn't have to be a security engineer. Design can make complexities understandable to everyday people. And design affects things like policy. For example, when we look at areas like dark patterns. Dark patterns are design patterns that unintentionally or intentionally trick and manipulate users into making decisions they normally would not have made. And I've only been focused in the larger general press journalistic publications recently, even though designers have known about dark patterns for years. Some policy researchers have pointed this recent popularity on fo or focus on dark patterns could, could be because dark patterns have started to cause more serious widespread change. For instance, when filing taxes, as we saw with ProPublica's research into TurboTax in the United States, or the implications of the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, AKA the GDPR. As we see here, really quickly, I'm gonna show you a common dark pattern I've noticed in GDPR pop-ups that I've been documenting for almost the past two years since GDPR was passed. This is on Harper's Bazaar. As you can see, there are two settings here, cookie settings and accept all cookies. But one of these looks more, it, one of these feels more, pops out more, to touch, one feels more like a button. It's the darker one, except all cookies. However, cookie settings, which has a line underneath it, clearly reads as, as though it's selectable, but it's not as enticing to press. and also doesn't feel like a button. It maybe feels like it opens some text. But what happens when you click on cookie settings? Suddenly you get these much more legible and, and consensual choices. The consent button here to actually reject all is hidden under multiple steps, and this is a dark pattern. So again, why design? Can a door be political? 
Yes, it can. But can it be art? Can a door or design be art? Well, perhaps. What does art do? It transports us. It's poetic. It analogizes. It creates artifacts of visual interpretation. It is not necessarily direct or didactic. It is different from design, or rather, it aims to achieve different things. But how can design be art? Now, I'm from the United States, so I was uh, trained in a more traditional US design sense. In the United States, design is useful, but also profitable. That meant I was taught that design meant objects and utter usefulness and things that are purchased. But design is so much more than that. Design affects so much more than that. How can design be something explorative, speculative, poetic, and still critique and comment on this moment? This is where I turn to the work of critical design. Critical design is design that addresses the limitations of product design. Critical design is a term was coined in 1997 by Anthony Dune, and it comes from a practice he developed with Fiona Rabbi when they are research fellows at the Royal College of Art. Critical design as a practice is, quote, one among a growing number of approaches that aims to prevent and define inter interrogative, discursive, and experimental approaches in design practice and research. Design, critical design demands that design stop existing in terms of capitalist production, which is a function of product design, and push product design towards self-examination and, and cultural critique. Dune and Rabbi highlight that by acknowledging that the design process needs to mature and find ways of operating outside of the constraints of servicing industry. In this case, at its worst, product design would simply reinforce capitalist values. Design needs to be seen for what it is as a possibility and one possibility and to develop alternative roles for itself. It needs to establish an intellectual stance of its own or the design profession is destined to lose all intellectual credibility and be viewed simply as an agent of capitalism. By redefining how product design can be created, critical design creates new ways for an audience to engage with design and understand all the different facets of design in their everyday lives. Now with these aforementioned works, such as the work of Dune and Rabbi, Mimi Onoa, Adam Hardy and Forensic Architecture, American Artist, etc., they can be viewed solely as art or even as research, but are much more richly viewed when much more richly seen when viewed as research-based arti artistic and activist practices. So in this context, design and art are the same for me. Now, while this is a wordy description, it really rings true to the intentions of the works. The works aren't just to bear witness, though that alone would be worthwhile. They question, they provocate, and they offer a solution to a problem. This should not be viewed as a form of techno-solutionism, however. The solutions that the artists provide are not meant to create an end-all be-all to other potential solutions, but rather to serve or offer temporary or open source fixes for gaps in, in inequity and violence created by society. And thus they become poetic witnesses of these gaps. This kind of band-aids is a similar space in where I pursue my own practice. Band-aids are necessary provocations or patches while participatory design and deconstruction along with artists, human rights researchers, activists, technologists, academics, and communities can overhaul the system or destroy systems together. The togetherness and collaboration is key though, but nonetheless, provocations within art and design can create new imaginaries for new realities. I'd like to quickly show some projects and explain where they came from. For example, I have one art project called Social Media Breakup Coordinator, which has come out of my eight years of studying online harassment and how systems can create harassment. I look at the affordances of technology. How do UX and UI decisions mitigate harassment? Can they amplify it? They can. I also look at the policy around online harassment. And then I do a lot of user research, both quantitative and qualitative, of how people are harassed, or what are different kinds of harassment campaigns, or the content of harassment. But let's go back to design for a second with harassment. Think about if you were being harassed. What does the system, the system that you're in, like a platform allow you to do? How can you create safety in that space? Can you be safe? It can be hard to find privacy settings, for example, or some systems don't have the right settings you need to maintain or create safety. Some of my research focuses on how, fo focuses on the harassment of everyday users and then journalists who can face really large scale threats like governmental surveillance or censorship all the way down to what we think of as more regular harassment um, such as microaggressions, name calling, gender-based threats, et cetera, and then harassment campaigns. Some of this work has been supported by 
different organizations like the Harvard Kennedy School and the Open Technology Fund. And this research does also inspire art as well. For example, an art piece called Social Media Breakup Coordinator started in 2015, comes out of this space of research and spending a lot of time studying and looking at how content moves online of what people, individuals can do to react or stop to it. And in the case of harass and in the case of harassment, how do people relate to or understand being online? How do we as a society respond to this idea of being online, that we're in these really structured and designed spaces? Where are the new kinds of anxieties and tensions that come up? For a lot of victims, for example, regardless of technical background or job, as I hear journalists and tech journalists actually say this a lot, they feel like they shouldn't be upset by what's said to them online. But you should be. It's okay to be hurt and affected by someone calling you dumb or sending you something as egregious as a death threat or a rape threat that is supposed to hurt. So as a researcher, I look at these anxieties as an artist and to create explorations or interventions around them. Social Media Breakup Coordinator is a performance art piece that explores the very intertwined and interconnections of our online and offline lives. This piece has gone through three iterations since 2015. So I'm exploring the connection between our digital tools and human intervention. Where do algorithms fail and humans must intervene? As users of social media, we live our most beautiful, angry, complex, and complicated lives online. So the project is me as a therapist or coordinator, if you will, um, giving people a series of questions. And then I look at the question, I hand built a very small algorithm to give them a series of puzzle piece solutions. So depending on what plat platform they're using, if they're having a problem with a friend, a coworker, someone they don't know, et cetera, I give sort of constrained, but puzzle piece together solutions that can feel personal to the other person. Every participant sitting with me, the coordinator, also signs a legally binding document drafted by my collaborator, Fred Jennings, who's a lawyer. Now, the legal document is also a part of the art, the art practice and experiment, ex experience, which everyone gets to keep and I also keep a copy of. But it effectively outlines that I am not a therapist and I'm also not held liable for damages that people are engaging of this of their own choice. Users also fill out, again, this 21 point user quiz where I then prescribe answers out of this algorithm I hand wrote with less than 20 suggestions. These suggestions are puzzle pieced together that feel like the user is receiving highly personal advice, when in fact, it is very rudimentally, very, very rudimentally algorithmically generated. Social media breakup coordinator started as a comment on a few different things. First, on the US, on the United States' lack of healthcare and mental health support, as well as, as, well as the growing gig economy, and on um, how people were relying on chatbots and also creating different kinds of startups that outsource human labor. In this project, I'm effectively a gig economy therapist as well as a digital security trainer and advice giver. So for a few dollars, 15 minutes, people fill out a survey and I give them feedback. While well, it started off as algorithmic feedback, me mimicking this chatbot, it actually quickly turned into short feedback sessions. The feedback, the questions, and the interactions, though, all pull from my very real research of seeing the general anxieties people had of being online. It's exploring this idea of expendable health and how anxiety about the internet isn't taken very seriously, but it should be, and how there's actually so many problems incurred by these large social media platforms. And through this, I've created public data sets about these anxieties. Then again, in February 2019, I took over the same space, Baby Castles, to host an entire month of social media breakup coordinator with new artwork, a video game uh, arcade, and weekly talks featuring Fei Lu, Pamela Lau, Jacqueline Maybe, Charles Burkowski of Arena, Molly Soda, and others. New games that were installed were called Wrong Box, Museum of the Same Image, Yet Another Exhausted Day, Attack of the Terms and Conditions, Wonders of the Internet, and Valentine's Doom. The games themselves combined with the talks and performance as well mediations on the problems and anxieties within social media. We eventually took, again, crafted public data, uh, had people write in thoughts in response to prompts and created a moving algorithm projected on the wall, inspired by the workshops at the end of the exhibit, which you see the curator, Lauren Gardner, um, looking through and exploring. I also curated a series of posters and art pieces on disconnecting from technology and social media from artists and researchers like Sadat Harry, Merrick Kay, Helen She Will Sing, Salome Siga, and myself. And I also held social media with coordinator sessions at Baby Castles, which you see here. Then later in December 19, 
2019, I won a residency with Academy Slash Solitude, and I created a critical design chatbot with Alex Rifagea of Community Labs. Chatbot is designed to respond to questions and care for the victim, as well as create a series of open source best practices and guides and what to do when facing online harassment. This bot is an extension of social media with a coordinator. The bot tells the user that it shouldn't exist, but it does to fill this void created by platforms, that the help and feedback the bot provides should actually be handled by real people and trained professionals on these platforms, but it does not exist. Until that kind of help infrastructure does exist, the bot will exist. So my work likes to play with this tension of being useful, but also highlighting deeper issues at play. But how does usefulness affect art and AI? Or rather, why does it matter? This is something I'm working through iter iteratively with my critical design art project, Feminist Dataset. Feminist Dataset started in 2017 when I was a researcher at IBM Watson, and I was looking at the many documented cases of problems in technology and bias in machine learning. Feminist Dataset has held workshops at the University of Indiana Bloomington, the iSchool professors and librarians, Space Art and Technology, Ars Electronica, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Museum of Modern Art Bologna, as well as others. It is a critical research and art project that examines bias in machine learning through data collection, data training, um, selecting and uh, inserting neural networks into, into a product, and then playing with new forms of user interface to eventually create this uh, creation of a feminist artificial intelligence system placed inside a chatbot. The project is inspired by the work of the maker movement, Arte Util, the Critical Engineering Manifesto, Xenofeminism, the Feminist Principles of the Internet, the Data, data Feminism Movement, and others. But how can usefulness in art influence technology? And this is where I think process-based artwork is helpful. And again, this is where I turn to Tony Bergera's concept of Arte Util, the utilitarian art which explores this notion of usefulness, util of utilitarianism to create interventions that are both artwork and a tool. Useful art is a way of working with the aesthetic experiences that focus on the implementation of art in society, where its function is no longer to be a space for, signal for signaling problems, but a place for which to create the proposal and an implementation of possible solutions. We should go back to the times when art was not something to look at in awe, but something to generate form. If it is political art, it deals with consequences. If it deals with consequences, I think it has to be useful art. Feminist data set is also thinking about hacking and art as processes for investigation. Ethical, communal, hackable design technology, I think is a start towards an ethical future. It allows for community input and for a community to drive or change a decision about a product, a technical capability and its infrastructure. Famous principles of the internet, uh, sort of launched by the NGO APC is a manifesto that addresses how to build from this technology for the internet and builds upon this ethos by recognizing that the process of making technical infrastructure of who it's built for has political ramifications. Vivis principles of the internet pushes open source technology and communities further by demanding space for marginalized groups and intent within, te within technology and it's this ethos in which feminist data set exists. Feminist principles of the internet, as well as theories like cyborg feminism and xenofeminism, call for a change in how technology and how and, and how technology functions, as well as a change of leadership and ownership for that technology. The manifesto of feminist principles, feminist principles of the internet demands a redefinition and repurposing of technology and open source. Quote: Women and queer persons have the right to code, design, adapt, and critically and sustainably use ICTs and reclaim technology as a platform for creativity and expression, as well as to challenge the cultures of sexism and discrimination in all spaces, end quote. Then this document of their manifesto, Feminist Principles of the Internet defines agency as a necessary form of empowerment. Quote, we call on the need to build an ethics and politics of consent into the culture, design, policy, and terms of service of internet platforms. Women's agency lies in their ability to make informed decisions on what, what aspects of their public or private lives are shared online. End quote. Then this data set exists within this realm of both technology and agency as a critique on current machine learning infrastructure and practices, as well as a, te as well as a technical framework and critical methodology and practice-based artwork attempting to address these issues. This is also where I look to the work of the Critical Engineering Manifesto by Julian Oliver, Gordon um, Savicic, and Danya Vasili. The Critical Engineering Manifesto outlines 10 principles as a guide to creating 
engineering pro projects, code systems and ideals. Similar to critical design, it exists to examine the role that engineering and code play in everyday life, as well as art and creative coding projects. Principles seven, or two and seven address the role of shifting technology. Number two, the critical engineering, the critical engineer raises awareness with that, with that, that with each tech, technological advance, our techno-political literacy is challenged. Number seven, the critical engineer observes the space between the production and consumptions of technology. Acting rapidly in the space, the critical engineer serves to expose moments of imbalance and deception. So Feminist Dataset is this multi-year project using intersectional feminism as a framework for investigating machine learning. It is trans-inclusive and focuses on racial justice. Is extremely process driven. So the outputs of the project or the artifacts are workshops on data and machine learning, essays, printed matter, and varying forms of documentation. Currently, there are two nodes or parts of the feminist data set, though there will be more as we go through the machine learning pipeline. The first node has been data collection, and the second is now data cleaning. What you see here is a photograph from the, uh, from the project being um, having been installed at Soho 20 Gallery where we were collecting data as a public wall in the gallery where visitors could add notes or suggestions of data. And now we're sorting it. The data in feminist, in feminist data is written text in any kind of written text. Within this project, the workshops are key since they are a mechanism to think through what community-driven ethical data, data collection looks like and allow the community to add inputs and iterate during the workshops. In these workshops, we discuss what does intersectional data look like? What does it mean? I'll give a brief, I also give a brief breakdown of machine learning data and the politics of data collection, how data is used in software and technology in these workshops as well. What we see here is a video documentation of when I was presenting, I don't know if it's playing, Well, that's fine. Um, it's just video documentation of uh, me giving some of the workshops during COVID-19. With data collection, we move slowly. This is farm to server table style data. And we've built a series of methodologies pulling from data feminism, but also asking what is legible data, what is consensual data, what is transparent data, and how do we define this without just using those words? The project deals with tensions, trade-offs, and bigger questions about technology Often we talk about methods for citing data and storing, and storing it, referencing other literature in the field of equitable data, ethical AI, responsible AI, and the data feminist movement. From workshops, I've been collecting suggestions, frameworks, and protocols from the participants that will soon be published and documented. Um, and I would love any of your feedback. Often participants ask for suggestions on transparency measures and consent, meaning for a feminist data set, for example, we list out the data we find and we list the person that submitted it we've been asking, should we notify the authors? We include data that is self-published and alternative, alternatively published and academically published to be inclusive as possible. But is it enough? And what does inclusive enough mean? So the point of the project is to ask that, test that, and try that. Um, in our workshops, we also reference the seven principles of data feminism to understand uh, what feminist data could look like if we were to create our own data set. So examining power, challenging power, rethinking binaries and hierarchies, elevating in emotion and embodiment, embracing pluralism, considering context, and making labor visible. We also talk about Professor Kimberly Crenshaw's work, The Career of Intersectionality. We also, have to, uh, we also have to unpack intersectional feminist in writing. So for example, we aren't just collecting work that's about feminism, but rather it's the act of intersectionality or, and intersectional feminism inside of writing. So the work doesn't have to be about feminism. Giving you an example, someone could include an article about income inequality. An intersectional feminist article would highlight that white women, black women, indigenous women, Latinx women, and trans folks of all different races are paid all different amounts. So an article that simply represents all women as a monolith is not intersectional and cannot be in the data set. Within our workshop, community members research and submit written data 
be it texts, poems, blogs, transcripts, conversations, whatever. The only time my hand as the creator appears is to remove non-intersectional data, and I'm extremely firm about this. That means I have to read everything that is submitted. This is some data that's currently in the data set, and it's just a small slice of the submitted data. Something to keep in mind effectively is that feminist data set is also an archive and a comment on or the confrontation of the politics of publishing and citations. Perhaps something here we want to keep in mind is that I used to work at the Wikimedia Foundation on the anti-harassment team. And while I deeply agree and respect the policies of citations within the Wikimedia community and on Wikipedia, it would be inappropriate and unjust of me to talk about feminist data and feminist interventions and not point out how that citation policy adversely affects women, non-cis people, and marginalized voices. People from marginalized communities are cited less than their white and male counterparts. At the point of my project is to confront bias, I have to deeply think about my own structures and methodologies of how I perpetuate bias in the structure of this project. And I thought, it's not enough to just look for feminist text. I too need to reflect on the structure protocol of quote, what kind of text, end quote, I'm soliciting. This means I've removed or loosened uh, specific citation, citation requirements. Text can be unpublished, can just be text messages, blogs, transcripts of conversations, again, poetry, essays, even things written on the spot. This kind of dialogue and critique is necessary to more fully embody the heart and intention of the project. Feminist data set operates in a similar vein pedagogically to Thomas Twait's Toaster Project, which you see here, which is a critical design project in which Twait builds a commercial toaster from scratch, from melting iron ore to building circuits to creating a new plastic toaster body mold. Feminist data set, however, takes a critical and artistic view on software and machine learning. What does it mean to thoughtfully make and consider every, every angle of making, iterating, and designing? Every step of this project process needs to work and every step needs to be thoroughly reimagined. Again, similar to how Twaits built this commercial toaster. Here's an image from Feminist data set installed at the Victorian Albert Museum in the Artificially Intelligent exhibit. My current project named TRK, or Technically Responsible Knowledge, is an open source. I do want this one to play though. It's thinking. I give it a second. Okay, here we go. My current project named TRK, or Technically Responsible Knowledge, is an open source project that examines wage inequality and creates open source alternatives to data labeling and training in AI, and is a part of the Feminist Dataset Project. Um, it's which and. It's a part of the Feminist Data Set project, which now focuses on data labeling and the systemic issues around labor and visibility and the creation of maintaining data structures and training data algorithmic models. TRK was funded by the Mozilla Foundation and created with Kate Diem, Ian Arnaud Fumat, and Rainbow Unicorn. Across 2019, I interviewed research labs, startups, and artists who were using Mechanical Turk style platforms and services, and I interviewed microservice workers across Cloudflower, Fiverr, and Mechanical Turk. I even became a Mechanical Turker myself for a few weeks. Let's see if this will play. Sorry, I apologize. I didn't. Um, it played fine before I started recording, but I'm guessing it's just my computer. Let's see if it works. Wait a second. Sorry, so TRK is this open source uh, tool for data set training 
and labeling a time consuming but integral aspect of machine learning that must be completed in part by a human. So this tool offers a wage calculator that you saw on the previous slide to help visualize a livable wage those that will be responsible for completing the tasks. As an artist who uses AI as material to explore and make art, I was really struck by how many startups and even uh, some of the different lab workers I spoke to and even artists who use Mechanical Turk style platforms, but with not a lot of thought actually given to the payment structure or the workers on those platforms in terms of those workers being full-time Mechanical Turkers. So Mechanical Turk and similar platforms have had well-documented cases of horrendous worker-related issues and I'm just going to move this forward, um, such as severely underpaying contracts. In many instances, even if a lab or individual is trying to price equitably, the interface of Mechanical Turk can work against it um, by not actually showing the aspect of time, how long it takes to create something and how the price is then could potentially be changed or reflected. Thinking again, I'll keep going. If the machine learning pipeline is death by a thousand cuts, think of TRK as one band aid for one small cut. The project doesn't propose a solution for all issues related to machine learning or even a major one for Amazon's Mechanical Turk. So many issues of machine learning are issues of a more deeper societal ingrained inequity, which can only be addressed through large shifts in restructuring society or legislation. Both in that, as an artist and designer, I try to look at what kinds of research work can help or alleviate or expose these issues. TRK focuses on how through pricing instructives, pricing structures, platform incentives, and the invisible nature of gig work, clients can undervalue, underprice, and fundamentally misunderstand how tasks are handled in human as a service platforms. Part of the design thinking behind TRK is to examine transparency within interfaces and in the design of tools and what kinds of problems tool design, UX, and UI create in technology. Again, inspired by data sheets for data sets, white paper, TRK also injects plain text information in the data set with information that includes a description of what the data set is, um, when it was made and who made it. UX or user experience design is a utilitarian intelligence focusing on architectural layouts, usability, and user flows, but design has a politics to it. It can suppress or uplift um, content. Design, much like technology, isn't neutral. As an artist, I use design as a material to conf con confront and comment on the slickness and inequity of for-profit technologies. Next slide. Put this one to play. I made a short video from a residency with Rainbow Unicorn Gallery earlier this year, focusing on questions around what an equitable work environment could be. So again, thinking of labor. What is feminist labor in cleaning a data set? Can that labor ever be feminist? Can that action ever be feminist? And what would it need to be equitable? And then scaffolding off that idea, what does the work environment or collaborative environment or the lab or collective need to look like? What structures does it need? Uh, what structures does it need to have be, to be, to even enable feminist work and then make feminist technology in a way it's turtles all the way down. But how we make things in the environment of making and the way we code and design are all intertwined. And this is what the project is exploring. What makes it a critical design project and an art project is that it will probably, you know, quote unquote, fail. And that's okay. The point of the project is to see where concessions were made and what those concessions were. And much like Thomas Twait's toaster from earlier, my project will be misshapen, though critically, by choice. The goal here is to learn from process. 
however imperfect that process may be. I'm an artist that deals with processes and ecosystems, and sometimes the tools I use don't quite work. So what if I could make them better? An interface is useful and expressive. I encourage everyone to reflect back on critical design, the methodology of removing capitalism from the structure of design. Design can be a tool much like technology and much like art to create, to create political and small acts of change and resistance. What can design be when we stop viewing it through a Western Silicon Valley and neoliberal lens? We've seen code and design or code and art made without the constraints of capitalism. It's time for design to do that as well. Thank you so much for your time.